So everyone asks me often if I had any storytellers in the family. And definitely, here it is, Dorothy Spaulding Gray. The thing that I remember mainly about her was the way that the older she got, the more she opened up. You know, she said, what does an old lady have to hide? And um, I feel the same way. What does an old man uh, of 44 have to hide? And what's the big secret about? What's the big secret? I'm Spalding Gray. For the past eight years, I've been telling very of my life story in front of audiences all over the world. It's often hard for people to describe what I do. Uh oh, it's one of those. Uh... Ooh. Typical New England days that want to make you take a shot of scotch at 9 o'clock in the morning. I've been called anything from a storyteller to a monologist to a performance artist uh, to a sit-down comic. I guess it really depends on how people want to package me or write about me. But basically what I do is I sit at a table in front of a group of people and tell the stories from my life. I can remember riding in a little straw basket on the back fender of my mother's bicycle as she rode along Barrington, the Barrington River. I was about four years old and she was riding along and crying out and celebrating and shouting because we had dropped the bomb on the Japs in Hiroshima and that meant World War II was over and that both my uncles, Tinky and John, were coming home from the war. A lot of people died in World War II. I didn't know any. The first death that occurred in our family was my cocker spaniel, Jill. We called her Jealous Jill because she was very jealous when my younger brother Channing was born. She was very jealous. And Jill died of distemper, which I thought meant bad temper <laughs> because she was bad tempered. And I would often provoke that dog because we had a pantry at our house in Rumstick Road. And in the pantry, I would drive Jill up into a corner with a little yellow rubber submarine and I would try to drive it at her house. I was about six years old. And, and one day, Jill just turned on me and took a snap right out of my wrist. I thought it was like, it looked like a bite out of an apple. It looked huge to me, but it couldn't have been that big since there's no scar there today. And I can remember running, screaming to my mother who was in the living room. And she said, you had it coming to you, dear. <laughs> Now, I don't remember my mother's touch as much as my grandmother's or the whole sense of the body. Uh, my mother and I had two physical relations, two physical rituals that I remember vividly. One was, well, I wasn't circumcised, so every Saturday after my bath, my mother would have to wash my tinkler, I believe we were calling it then. <laughs> And by pulling back the foreskin and then taking some baby oil and some cotton and then whooping over her knee and going mm, like a chore girl, you know, really hard. It felt like steel wool. I would be wincing and fighting off. I had no idea it could be pleasurable until I learned how to do it myself. I've been on the road telling my monologues all over the country. In the past, year, I've stayed in at least 40 motels, hotels. Well, I like to start the morning with a bath. Water is very important to me and the rituals around water. I don't know if that had to do with growing up in, in Barrington, in Rhode Island, around all that water, and maybe that's why I'm working so hard to save money for a house in the Hamptons. I don't seem to be able to live uh, too far away from it. I came upon this method of storytelling through my work in theater. 
I was working with the Worcester Group in New York City, and we began to use my memories and life experiences as a kind of source material to build our pieces on. Um, in Rumstick Road, which dealt with my mother's suicide, I remember just coming forward and speaking directly in a direct address way to the audience about my experiences of growing up in Barrington, Rhode Island. And uh, something clicked about that, that form of direct presentation, and I've been working with that method ever since. I think that some people are born people, and they grow up as people, and then they decide to become professionals because they have to make a living, right? And they become a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it is they study for, and then they go through life as that, and then they die, and then that's that. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, even some people study acting. They become actors through studying acting. Other people are born actors. It's an ontological condition. There's no way out. They are simply acting out all the time, you know? And I think I was in that state. For instance, when I was 12 years old, and, uh, and uh, some fireworks would go off, just a whole package of ladyfingers outside. And I'd take the cue and rush to the window and go, Mom, Mom, come quick. Russ, Russ Russell, our neighbor, is up on his roof shooting his children. <laughs> and, and that was before that happened so often, you know, in the old days. It wasn't a common occurrence. And my mother would buy right into it. She'd rush over going, what? Oh, 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 oh. No, no, oh, Spuddy, dear, no. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do you want to do this kind of thing? You know? And she was always telling me to try to think about the starving Koreans and, and try to, to understand. Anyway, I, I uh, was failing everything, and I got sent away to, to school, to Freiburg Academy, and I thought I, I would try out for the junior play. And uh, I, I was, not only was I dyslexic, but I was so nervous I couldn't hold a book. I was... Uh, uh. So I, um, I, di I didn't get the role. So my senior year, they did the uh, Curious Savages, the class play, and I said, by God, I'm going to try out the way I read, and I'm going to hold the book down so it won't move. And uh, I just read it the only way I could read. Cheese, eggs, milk, meat, haha. -ha. I drink about four pints of milk a day. Channel Island milk, haha. -ha. And eat about a pound of steak. And I got the role. Um, <laughs> because it took place in an insane asylum. Uh, they thought I was perfect for the role of the man who thinks he's Hannibal. He's deluded, he has delusions of grandeur, and he thinks not only is he Hannibal, that he can play the violin, and of course at the end of the play, everyone's fantasy comes true, and they put on violin music, and I'm ooh, soaring away. Now, opening night, and of course we only played two nights at Freiburg Academy, <laughs> but opening night there was a carpet down there, you know, with. Um, squares on it. It wasn't at rehearsal. And I remember I had to do a downstage left cross and I improvised a hopscotch in character on the squares. And the entire audience laughed. Like that, only everyone <laughs> complete. And I was hooked. I was hooked. It went through me like a thump, like a whoo, like a you know what. And I didn't want to do anything else. Uh, that I knew. There was nothing else I wanted to do before that, so this was a novelty. You know. <laughs> And I went to my, uh, I went to my guidance uh, counselor and I said, I've decided not to go to college. After all, I found finally what I like doing. I want to go to New York City and go to an actor's studio. I want to become an actor. He said, what do you know about acting? You've been in one play. You've got to go to a liberal arts college. I feel more comfortable on so-called stage or in the performance, live performance area than I do in, in, in uh, what we call real life. I, I, excuse me, I, I brushed my tongue. <laughs>